My name is Caitlin Lynch, and I wanted to thank you all for coming to listen to this presentation. And thank you for selecting me as a featured speaker from LaGuardia Community College. Um, I also wanted to thank my mentor, Dr. Fuentes, and the CRSP program directors, um, Dr. Senkov and Dr. Hosanna, for all their support through this process. Um, so just to introduce myself to everyone, um, I am a current student studying environmental science at LaGuardia. Um, I've been living in New York for almost eight years. I'm originally from the West Coast, but I moved here really because I love the city. And I actually had no um, really specific career ambitions like so many people that do move here. And I honestly never thought I would be studying the environment in such an urban place, um, but here I am. Um, I actually have a previous degree in urban and environmental policy. Um, so I've worked on a lot of kind of social issues, uh, social science related issues. Um, however, after moving here, um, I kind of was looking for a shift in my life and I wasn't really able to find jobs in that area. So I ended up just working a ton of odd jobs. And after quite a few years of that, I found myself pretty uninspired and pretty unhappy actually with kind of my job prospects. So I, I kind of did a little soul searching and I, as other people here have said previously, um, I really asked myself, like, what do I care about? What has always captured my attention? What am I super curious about? And I thought if I could answer that question, I could try to figure out how to do that as a career. Um, so I, my answer to that question is the natural world. And this is just an area <laughs> all around us that I've been super interested in since I was a little kid, you know, just like looking under rocks and seeing what bugs are there and climbing trees and picking flowers. And I, I love that stuff. And I thought, how do I make that into a career? <laughs> so I thought um, the best step would to be to go to school to find out, you know, to get the skills I need, the science skills I needed. Um, and also learn more about what career opportunities are in that field. Um, I actually started at a well-known private university in the city and had a very, very difficult time there, um, mostly feeling really unsupported. Um, and I, I had a lot of anxiety going into this process, going back to school after a long time, studying science, being in the STEM field after never having done that before. Um, so actually a friend suggested LaGuardia. He was attending there in a different program. And I set up a meeting with the environmental science director, program director, Dr. Holly Porter Morgan. And after that meeting, I was convinced <laughs> LaGuardia would be a great place for me. Um, and it, it definitely has so far, absolutely. Um, so in my first semester, I took an intro to biology course. Um, this was taught by Dr. Fuentes, and she was actually the one who told me about CRSP and encouraged me to look into research programs. So this is kind of how I got involved in that. Um, and again, I would just reiterate what other folks have said today is that, you know, all of us here know about CRSP, but if you know other students that don't, tell them because, you know, every opportunity you can get to connect outside of courses with other students, with your professors, develop mentorship, develop these other like lab skills I didn't have. I encourage everyone, regardless of your field to, to really pursue every opportunity you can beyond your classes. So Dr. Fuentes had done other research with students um, about bacteria in the East River water, which is pictured behind me here. Um, and she and I began discussing the idea of studying bacteria in the sediment as well. And I, since I'd kind of come from a policy background previously, I was interested in seeing how land use and redevelopment strategies were affecting the environment in these shoreline areas. And I noticed that there was a lot of parks and urban or green spaces being developed along the shoreline, like since I've lived here, new new developments. And I was also working with the Newtown Creek Alliance, which is an organization working to clean up and restore the Newtown Creek. So I knew that these areas were getting a lot of attention in terms of restoration. And we were trying to figure out how to like measurably determine what environmental benefits that restoration is having on the local ecosystems. So I'm now gonna share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, we can. 
Awesome. Okay. You never know with Zoom sometimes. <laughs> okay, one sec. Okay, so our research project is titled Microbiome Profiles of Estuarine Sediment in New York's East River. It is a comparative study of three restored sites. And in other words, this is asking what bacteria live in the mud. <laughs> um, so I, oops, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to provide an introduction and background, go over our methods and procedures, um, review some of our main data, and leave a time for discussion and questions. Um, I wanted to start with this image of modern day New York and what New York might have looked like in around the 1600s before colonialization, um, really just to give us a sense of how much development has occurred here and what the range of possible land uses could be for this area. So as I mentioned in our title, um, our research project looks at bacterial diversity in the sediment at three different sites along the river. And although, although called uh, East River, it is actually a tidal estuary of saltwater that connects the Long Island Sound to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it is host to many unique species and is also obviously very affected by human activity. And like many tidal marshes and wetlands across the globe, it's a really important ecosystem that is increasingly at risk due to climate change, sea level rise, and increased development. So in our project, we asked the question, do the alpha and beta diversity of sediment bacteria vary between different shoreline sites restored using different strategies? And if so, do these differences indicate varied levels of ecosystem health? And just to clarify, alpha diversity is the diversity of species within a population and beta is between populations. So you might be wondering why bacteria, <laughs> uh, why this is helpful to measure. Um, bacteria are the oldest organisms on earth. They're abundant everywhere, including all over our bodies. You know, most people think of them as agents of disease or infection, but truthfully, the vast majority actually provide beneficial roles to other living organisms. And most importantly, they're able to convert nutrients from the environment into molecules that organisms can use and vice versa. So without these roles that bacteria play, life basically wouldn't have access to the molecules it needs to survive. Um, some of these processes are seen in the image here. We have um, nitrogen and phosphate are being converted and from and released into the environment. And I mentioned nitrogen and phosphate as important molecules, which are actually components of DNA. So no organism could make its own DNA if it didn't have access to those. Bacteria can also help us determine the source of pollutants. So for example, E. coli, as many people know, is a, bacter a bacteria normally found in human feces and in other animals. And this comes present in bodies of water when there is um, a lot of oh, sewage overflow after a heavy rain. So that's why we chose bacteria. Um, our three sites we chose are shown here. We have Bushwick, Bushwick Inlet Park, which is a recently restored recreational park with a rocky sandy shoreline. We have Hunter's Point Park, which is also recently restored and it's actually designed to function like a tidal marsh. So it has um, native grasses planted and it actually gets inundated with the tide water. And then Newtown Creek is a mostly unrestored uh, super fun site with bulkhead walls and many concrete edges. So we first collected these sediment and water samples from each site and determined their physical and chemical characteristics as well as some environmental conditions in the area. For the on-site environmental conditions, we measured temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen. Um, we then kept our water and sediment samples uh, at four degrees Celsius in the lab and until we isolated the DNA from those samples. Um, we then had to send the, the DNA to an off-campus um, genetic sequencing lab to find out which exact bacterial populations were there. Um, and this type of sequencing is very similar to the PCR test we all know about with COVID. Um, however, in this type of testing, it, it uses nucleotide sequences that are unique to bacteria, not viruses. So what did we find in the sediment? Um, each chart here represents the bacterial diversity by class for each site. And just to be clear, class is a kind of an organizational category used to group all living things. Genus and species are more narrow categories within that broader category. 
Um, as you can see by the various colors here, each, each site has a unique profile of bacteria. And we found that the diversity of bacteria within each site, the alpha diversity is actually greater than the diversity between each site, um, which actually points to the richness and diversity of each of the sites and the fact that many bacterial classes are, in, are common to all three. Um, some of the commonalities um, can be seen in these charts. The large blue wedge is the gamma proteobacteria class. This is characteristic of many marine sediments. And although it actually includes some known pathogens like E. coli and salmonella, gamma proteobacteria in coastal sediment are actually key players in what's known as dark carbon fixation, which are some of the largest carbon sinks on Earth. And carbon fixation is the process in which inorganic carbon, essentially from the atmosphere, is converted into organic, making it usable for organisms and also removing it from the atmosphere. Gamma proteobacteria also are used um, for bioremediation for their ability to take up uh, metals like iron and manganese, also removing them from the environment. The second largest bacterial class in all sites was the Flaviobacteriae. Uh, group, which are common in marine ecosystems that have high levels of organic material. They are also have a lot of specialized roles in organic decomposition and have been called master recyclers for their ability to transform carbon and other nutrients. So it's important just to note um, the data we found here that we're looking at is actually for the known and reported bacteria that have been classified. However, many bacterial sequences have actually not been reported to the scientific community um, or they're difficult to culture in a lab. So that makes this actually a really interesting area to study because there is so much to be learned about, about which specific bacteria are present. So unique to Bush, Bushwick Inlet Park were uh, bacteria that decompose cellulose, remineralize organic materials, and make energy using sulfur respiration which is a process used by organisms when there is little to no oxygen available. Um, this site also had the lowest diversity with only nine classes identified. Um, unique to Hunter's Point Park were common marine bacteria that aid in anaerobic digestion, also suggesting low oxygen levels in the sediment. Um, however, Hunter's Point Park had the highest number of classes identified with 16 total. And Newtown Creek, had the highest number of sulfur reducing bacteria, not, which were not present in any of the other sites, which indicated a high level of sulfur reduction when no oxygen is present at all in the sediment. Um, and we found 11 classes were identified at that site. But overall, where data was available at the more specific genus and species level, we found Hunter's Point Park uh, sediment had the richest diversity, which indicates a high level of health and a range of metabolic processes occurring there. Um, we also measured the environmental conditions of the surrounding area. These results showed similar pH and nitrate levels, um, but there was a pretty wide range of salinity, temperature, phosphate, ammonium, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, these results really show us that there are very unique microenvironments going on at each location. Um, and this is also seen by the larger organisms that were um, living there as well, such as the rockweed pictured here and the, um, the native salt marsh grass. So to summarize, uh, we found that the sediment bacteria does reflect unique uh, biogeochemical processes at each site. We found that the alpha diversity was greater than the beta diversity, and each site had a unique profile of classes with gamma proteobacteria being the most represented across all three sites. Uh, Hunter's Point Park, again, was the site with the greatest bacterial diversity. So I'll just end on the note that, you know, like I said before, there is really so much to be studied and understood about the complex roles that the bacteria play that we, we found in these sites. Um, but we really think that this type of study could be very useful as a longitudinal research project to help inform policymakers and stakeholders, especially as local community and advocacy groups become more interested in protecting these important habitats right along our shorelines. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you again for listening and let me know if you have any questions.
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Caitlin. And your first question is, let's see, I, this is very impressive. You may have discussed this, but I'm interested in how the arrival of Europeans changed the environment and most importantly, the variety and quantity of bacteria. How do scientists like yourself research this? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, unfortunately, people weren't, to my knowledge, collecting bacteria 400 years ago. But, um, you know, there could be some fossilized evidence of what lived there at the time. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm sure that could be measured. I'm just not really sure how that would be. But that would be very interesting to compare. And I have a question for you. So when you're gathering samples, um, is it, take say a, a kind of notorious place like Newtown Creek, mm -hmm. is it safe to you to, you know, I see that, <laughs> that you were gathering samples with your hands or at least someone was in their photograph. Um, is it safe? Yes, yeah, so we did wear gloves. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said, the, the Newtown Creek is heavily polluted uh, with a lot of hydrocarbons, which are not exactly dangerous to our health unless we consume a ton of them. Um, and there's other bacteria like E. coli. But again, if you're just washing your hands, not ingesting it, don't have any cuts on your hands, um, you should be fine. I haven't heard of anything happening. And I've also been working out there for like a year now. Okay, great, thank you. And then last question, we'll have to go on after this. Uh, do you know the level of bioremediation for lead in these samples that you're looking at? The level of bioremediation, like what would be required to remove the lead? Yes, I, so I'm not quite sure. This The question is from Dr. Hosanna. Um, oh. Dr. Hosanna, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you would like and ask the question directly. Or he may, so he's probably not in as a panelist okay. now. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, I'll just say in terms of bioremediation, I um, I don't, I'm very interested in that area. It's basically using, you know, organisms to remove pollutants from the environment. And there's a lot of bacteria that can do that. Um, I would be interested in seeing if there are applications uh, or I mean, I think basically it's interesting to see if there are applications for cleaning up some of these areas using bacteria. But I think also what this tells us is that there are there are heavy metal contaminants in this area because what we're finding is the bacteria that can process those. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Caitlin.